Good. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm glad you're still with us on such a uh, difficult day in many ways. But as was said before, the fact that stable coins are very stable today, I think, is something that we can take a lot of uh, encouragement from. Uh, so to, to start the uh, panel, um, I just let my, uh, let my presenters introduce themselves and maybe talk for a couple of minutes about their own projects. Uh, and then we'll go into the, the discussion and the Q&A. Sure. So, Luca, why don't you start? Okay, I'll, I'll start. Um, nice uh, seeing you all here. I am Luca Prosperi. I am an independent researcher. I, I work my own research in a sub stack called Dirt Roads, which is entirely focused on DeFi. I'm a core member of MakerDAO, where I look after financial, uh, the financial oversight of the protocol. And I advise a few funds, especially a, a VC fund based in Berlin called Cherry Ventures on their crypto projects. And I'm happy to be here. Great. Um, my name is Pablo. I'm a co-founder of the uh, Engel protocol. Engel is a decentralized uh, stablecoin protocol. We launched on the Ethereum mainnet uh, seven months ago now, and we are responsible for the issuance, I mean, the protocol is responsible for the issuance of AG Euro, a Euro stablecoin, which has become one of the biggest Euro stablecoin out there. And my, I'm a core contributor uh, of the protocol, trying to handle everything from development to operations. Great, great. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Nicola Plakas. I had a crypto business for Visa in Europe, focusing on uh, de delivering and shaping a strategy in the region. So, pleasure to be here today. Good. Thank you so much. So maybe we'll start uh, just by uh, maybe again, Luca, um, asking, asking you just to explain the environment for stable coins. How should we think about stable coins? Because there are different varieties. And I know you have some different views about how you would categorize different things. What does the audience need to know in terms of takeaways about stable coins to get us started? Yeah. I mean, without getting too geeky, um, I think the, stable, the term stable coin in crypto became a meme of a, an asset that is not volatile. So an asset that is mimicking the US dollar most of the times, or the euro in the case of Angle, um, which has been an adoption feature of a product. So a bit like um, when, you, when you are an emerging economy and you have a currency, you want to help investors invest in your currency. You try to pack that currency to an asset that has a larger market. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you need a, you need a pegging with another asset to, to do what the, a currency, a coin, should do. Sure. So I think this is the first caveat. That, that's the reason why I don't like necessarily the term stable coin for the future. I think uh, hopefully if the Ethereum economy or the blockchain economy will expand enough, we will not, we don't need, we'll not need the peg to an external asset any longer. But I also think that the term stable coin is a wrapper that uh, internalizes many, many things. And we are seeing this in the market. In some cases, like in the case of US, USDC, which is a circle grandfather stablecoin, uh, the stablecoin USDC is a great on-ramp, off-ramp uh, vehicle to come into crypto or leave crypto. In the case of DAI, for example, which is the stablecoin that is minted and managed by MakerDAO, which is the largest decentralized stablecoin uh, native in um, in DeFi, we have around seven billion dollars of floating currency now. We had ten billions up to two months ago. It is uh, an instrument of leverage and a value preservation because of the stability and over collateralization system. In other more, more in, like infamous cases, like the Terra stablecoin, it was basically a source of yield farming, meaning unsustainable yield leverage. Uh, masked behind the stability of a currency that was stable until it was not. Mm -hmm. So I think sometimes it was a system, it was a, it was a term that it was not always used uh, for, for the right uh, purpose. But in general, it is what the stablecoin wants to be is an asset that is, leaves a lot of volatility of the underlying economy to satisfy some uses, which are typically preservation of value, means of exchange, uh, unit of account, and I also think the most important one is the fourth one, which sometimes we, we forget, which is uh, incentivization of a resource allocation. Okay. So you tend to spend their time where you make more money. Right, right, right. Let me just um, go to Pablo and, and ask you a little bit more. When we're talking about what we would think about as um, algorithmically stabilized coins as opposed to fiat-backed stable coins, 
Give us a sense of how your project perhaps differs from the Maker project and the Terra project and these sorts of things. How should we as an audience think about these sort of differences? It's not just over collateralized, but there are a whole lot of different ways of doing things. What are the main parameters which we should be aware of? So I won't be too tacky, uh, but if, if I am, please don't hesitate to interrupt me. What all decentralized stablecoin try to do, they try to take a volatile crypto asset strip away the volatility to make something stable. And there are many different ways to eliminate uh, the volatility of an asset. What Maker does is that they are fragmenting the volatility. Each person can put some ETH and, or another asset and borrow collateral against it. And they are still responsible for the volatility of the asset. What UST had, it was under collateralized. They relied on what we call a secondary volatility token to absorb the volatility of the demand for the stablecoin. So Luna was this token. And Luna was sort of a proxy token for the demand of uh, UST. So when demand for UST increases, uh, the price of Luna uh, increased. And conversely, when demand for UST decreased. This doesn't hold super well because you cannot resist um, adverse market conditions, it can create uh, death spirals where everyone loses faith in the stablecoin and so everyone sells the, the governance token backing the stablecoin, which means people lose faith even more in the token. What we do at Angle, we try to build something that slightly improves over what Maker does because Maker, it's, it works super well, it resists any market condition, but sometimes you lose, it's not capital efficient, like to create one die except if you use USDC, you have to bring more than $1 worth of collateral. So we wanted to build something which is capital efficient, like creating $1 of one euro of stablecoin necessitates one euro of collateral. The way we do is that we let people come with collateral assets, swap them for euro stablecoins, and then we sell the volatility of the collateral assets we have to other people like long traders. And so we're like a marketplace between people who want stability and people who want volatility. Yeah. And then we rely on the third layer of security of people who just want yield. But yeah, that's maybe a bit too technical. So yeah, we should see ourselves as like people who want stability and the others getting the volatility of the people who want stability. Yeah, great. And I just want to go back to Luca before we, we, we turn to Nicola. And that is already we, we mentioned that Maker is perhaps not the most efficient um, in terms of collateralization use and that sort of thing. Can you talk about some of those pros and cons? Because I know you personally have been pushing for even higher over collateralization at, uh, at Maker in recent months. Yeah. So Maker um, adopted this design uh, choice of asking for way more collateral in order to um, to mint and distribute coins, which is not very different from what the way actually we get currency distributed in, in the traditional world. So you go to a bank, you ask for a mortgage, you bring a property that is worth 100, they give you a mortgage that is you know 50% loan to value, uh, hopefully it's not more than 100%, but let's say it's lo lower than the value of the property, and that money doesn't come from a central bank. That money is printed by the, by the commercial bank and deposited into, in, in, your, in, your, in your current account. So it's not very different. Um, we, we do that, be why? Because we think the underlying asset, especially crypto asset, is very volatile. So we want to protect our currency and the stability of our currency with a, with a buffer. Now, there is, it is true, like, uh, like, the, like the, the angle team says, that it's, it's under the over collateralization is, is a limiter for growth. But in my personal opinion, given how small is DeFi, we, rather than focusing on the denominator, we should focus on the numerator. So we should try to onboard as many use cases and collateral assets as possible. And that's what Maker has been trying to do. So we have been trying to, now we have Societe General coming to pledge a cover bond. We have a bank in the US uh, called HVB that is opening, opening a syndication program where they will bring mortgages as collateral. So we want to expand the collateral pool. At the same time, we know that the more we move away from basic, simple assets uh, used as collateral, which is ETH in, exam in the example of the Ethereum ecosystem, there are a lot of other risks that are not the volatility of the underlying token that we need to cover against. And that's why I've been advocating a maker to create a surplus buffer, an extra buffer at the protocol level uh, to protect against those risks, those risks in the same way the core tier one capital works for banks. Yeah. And we can do that in a non-dilutive way by creating a, 
a yield deposit vault where people that have a die they can deposit it and get a yield and provide first uh, first loss absorption for the protocol. That has this has other philosophical implications for the DeFi ecosystem that yep. I will not indulge in. But I think, for example, one 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 that is fascinating is that it can it could create a rates market. And now in DeFi we don't have medium to long term rates. So if you're an institutional investor, you cannot invest or borrow in DeFi because you never know how your cost of funding will sure. look in two blocks sure. two blocks time. Yeah, great. Okay, let's uh, let's pick up on the institutional adoption angle there, and and maybe go to uh, Nicola. From your perspective, what are the conversations that you're having with institutional investors and potential clients and these sorts of things on the stablecoin front, whether that's uh, fiat-backed stablecoins or whether it's um, algorithmically stabilized stablecoins at the moment? Where do you think the discussion is right now? Yes, so, so we talk with a lot of institutions, and you know, after the Terra crash happened, there were a lot of questions of what is really a stable coin, how do you define it, how do you think about it, and, and you know, I think it's a, a good indicator that not all quote-unquote stable coins are created equal, and some, of, some have like inherent risks which are really, you know, they're not collateralized by fiat, which is where we would typically look at, and for us, a you know, fiat-backed stable coin, or even central bank digital currency could be used in the future to make everyday payments and really kind of focus on use cases such as you know payroll payments streaming micro payments and it's kind of more closer to where uh, us and kind of our clients are playing so really we think that there needs to be some form of um regulatory oil which can, which can help how the transactions which help govern actually how transactions and money movement between consumers and businesses are conducted especially if you want to put it on larger scale mm -hmm. and kind of cross and add a kind of cross-border element um, so, yeah. So, let me pick that up because we had an interesting conversation just uh, in, the, in the waiting lounge here about regulation and about interaction with regulators. And I was very surprised that both of these gentlemen have very little interaction with regulators. They, they prefer to spend time on their projects and so on. Can you provide a little bit of context for that? Why? I mean, it, for a lot of us in TradFi, this seems like the biggest risk to the stablecoin space is regulation. And yet, you know, two developers that are very involved in the project have very little interaction. So uh, I, I'd say that first, from our perspective at Angle, we're still a small protocol. We still have a market fit to be found. We, we still need to grow to grow our brand. And every minute we spend talking to regulators, it's a minute we're not spending uh, working on our product. So that's one first thing. The other thing is that the technology is changing by a lot currently in the stablecoin space. Like mm. everyone is shifting towards a maker-like model, but m more protocols are going to resemble like central banks doing opening credit lines to other lending markets. Sure. So this is something the regulation cannot adapt at the moment. Um, what is going to be voted in Europe, the Mika regulation, it's really blurry when it comes to decentralized stablecoins. And if they try to regulate it, well, the market would be so different when laws are going to be enforced in 2024. So that's why it's also, I believe, a, a waste of time at this point. What is not a waste of time is the educational efforts we could do with regulators. So on my side, I accept any call with a regulator. And my point is that we are not building against them. Like a euro stablecoin, it's a weapon of the European Central Bank. Like if the euro depreciates with respect to the dollar, well, our stablecoin will do the same. And their policies are going to dictate how our stablecoin behaves. Yeah. Uh, and it's important that we are on our side are defending the European uh, economic sovereignty, uh, monetary sovereignty. So um, yeah, it's kind of mixed feelings. We don't want to, we, we don't want we want them to know about us and to regulate around us, but we also want to grow to a size where uh, it would be a no-brainer to sure. make the lows around sure. what we're building. Sure. So Luca, you you're already at that size in the sense that you are the prominent decentralized stable coin. You know, Terra was giving you a little bit more than a run for your money and, and you've come out of that very, very well. What what's your situation? I mean, I think this uh, it deserves an introduction that for people that are not uh, crypto native or deeply involved in crypto could be mind bending. But I'm not employed by MakerDAO. MakerDAO doesn't have a legal entity. Yep. MakerDAO is not a company. Yep. MakerDAO is just a, a, con a, a, a concept uh, that are around which people collaborate, but ultimately is a set of smart contracts. 
So nobody is responsible for, for Maker, nobody controls its resources, nobody can switch it off. Uh, so it is difficult to identify who is talking uh, on behalf of MakerDAO. I am not, you know, I'm a collaborator, I, I belong, I, I'm part of the community, I have a role in the community, but I don't represent the community, nobody does. So I think this is the first, the first, uh, the first point, which I think it's very important because we want to create a decentralized stablecoin. So by definition, we don't want to have any attack vector uh, or any person controlling its resources or dictating its, um, mm. uh, um, it, its actions or development. Now, also, I think we, uh, we interact with, uh, with some institutional, with institutional borrowers that are exposed to regulation. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, I just mentioned that Societe Generale will most probably, because we are finalizing the voting on chain, but will most probably refinance a small portion, but uh, some cover bonds. I mean, Societe Generale is, is a globally systemic bank, so it's the, the highest level of regulation you can get. And, and they are still doing it, and the regulator is aware of it. I think we are, uh, we were very critical about the Terra evolution, me personally through my own research and the protocol, because we thought that would have been dangerous for the whole ecosystem. But if you look at Maker average, uh, average vault owner, we are already at pretty much business oriented or institutional oriented uh, protocol. Like retail don't come to Maker to, sure. to get leverage for their holdings. And so I think Professionalizing the access in, to crypto or the exposure to crypto is something that will only benefit yeah. protocols like yeah. MakerDAO. Yeah. So we are very open to discuss with regulators and to help them. But yeah. by, def by, by design, yeah. we cannot have an interaction with regulators yeah, because sounds, we don't exist. It sounds like both by design and it sounds essentially like you're outsourcing the interaction with regulators to the clients who are regulated entities in the institutional space. Yes. Yeah. Or we might have some delegates or some people that decide to affiliate themselves with the community and they decide to we have some of those delegates or investors like our cap table table includes some of the largest investors in crypto and recent paradigm para Phi, pantera standard etc and they are having discussions with yep. the regulators yep. but a smart contract cannot have a discussion yep. with the regulator yep. yep good good let me shift the discussion on a little bit in terms of how the environment is going to look over the course of the next few years. My sense is that by the time we get to 2025, the stablecoin market, and in, in fact, the whole crypto market is going to look very, very different from what we have today. And so I'd like to ask Nicola in particular, with regard to both innovations in TradFi, I mean, we have a lot of payments innovation and this kind of stuff, which I think a lot of people in crypto are often unaware of and you can think about things like the fed now system which is going to be in play in 2023 you can think about pics in brazil you can think about i don't know upi in india these are real time very very cheap money transfer type uh, frameworks you can think about as you mentioned central banks digital currencies and you could think about also a lot of regulated institutions like my own bank and other banks who are going to be very keen to have their own stable coins, whether it's a dollar or a euro or a, a Swiss franc uh, and these kinds of things. How do you see from your side of things the interaction of the existing environment in stable coins with Tether and USDC and, yep. and DAI and these sorts of things with some of these other things evolving over the course of the next two or three years? That's a lot of questions in one, but let me try to answer them Take all. Take what you like. Um, I, I would say that, you know, from our perspective, we see that there is definitely going to be a role for um, fiat bank digital currencies in form of either stable coins or central bank digital currencies. Um, they will focus on some of the use cases described before, but they, they could also be focusing on some of the use cases we are not thinking about today. I always see a great potential in, in stable coins as kind of being almost like the Lego building blocks of new kind of capabilities and products that you can have. In addition, I would say that um, from a consumer perspective or user perspective, there is still, I would say, quite a bit of friction in the user journey. So yeah, today you can use a number of really kind of interesting um, crypto products and capabilities to you know, do a remittance or kind of borrow money or maybe even kind of do, do a transaction between the two parties. But I, I would say you need to be relatively crypto savvy to engage and interact with a number of different apps to complete a relatively straightforward 
uh, transaction in the like, existing kind of fiat ecosystem, which as you kind of rightly mentioned, is also investing quite a bit to kind of make this user journey experience much better. I would say that we'll see a, a lot of innovation and also there is probably going to be space for all the systems that you described and kind of stable coin innovation because they might be covering some of the existing use cases uh, together, they might be covering them separately, they might be competing for the same use cases, but there might be like brand new ways of interacting we haven't even thought about yet. And that's where, you know, the really interesting part about programmability of money comes in and, and what else can you build with, you know, smart contracts and how else can you interact on, on top of that with a new type of protocols and then and most importantly, at least from our perspective, is you need to have a regulatory overlay and confidence that consumers and businesses using these new tokens can effectively redeem them at par. Uh, which is why I would say the interaction and engagement between you know, key um, stablecoin schemes and emerging stablecoin schemes and regulators are, is and will be extremely important mm -hmm. to make sure that we have the right set of rules and regulations of how transactions, especially like large-scale mass transactions with and money movement between consumers and businesses is conducted. Mm -hmm. So we'll see a lot of interesting innovation and I'm quite excited also to hear about the yeah. projects today and I'm also curious to see how they will interact with some of these um, innovations in the, let's call it, traditional fiat ecosystem that you, ma that yeah. you mentioned earlier. Yeah, 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 yeah. Gents, how do you see at least the, con the, the competition between fiat stabilized stable coins, Tether, USDC, this sort of thing, and, and your projects? How do you see that evolving? Do you think that they have more of a regulatory threat than you have? Uh, they have because um, they are going to be more systemic than we are as, I mean, I don't, same as Lucas, same disclaimer, like uh, I, I don't represent the Angle Protocol, I'm a contributor in it, but um, centralized stable coins are used uh, are the best unramping way to crypto as possible, yeah. like one dollar, you get one USDC, it's super smooth, uh, it's far more efficient, and this is what is going to make them more systemic than we are. Decentralized stable coins, I think we are going to serve different use cases, uh, so Luca mentioned the leverage for stable coins, I think in terms of credits, decentralized stable coins are going to open the way also in DeFi to under collateralized loans. Um, essentially, decentralized stablecoin protocols will become like crypto banks uh, doing doing loans uh, here and there and handling handling the credit risk, which centralized stablecoins won't be able to do. They'll be able to do it sometimes, but they won't be able to do. One thing I want to mention is that what we're building, we're building protocols. Um, when you're using Facebook, TikTok, you don't know what are the underlying protocols. Mm -hmm. And what I see for the stablecoin space is that there will be a layer four, layer five, so essentially a UX layer, where you will be able to pay uh, with stablecoins enjoying the permissionless aspects of it without yep. uh, users I mean, seeing the, the real complexity behind sure. it. Sure. And there are protocols like Curve, it's yep. a decentralized uh, protocol to exchange stablecoins, yep. uh, which are going to be powering this layer of stablecoins. Yep. So having multiple stablecoins, centralized, algorithmic, decentralized, it's not bad uh, in the ecosystem because it creates a lot of use cases. It creates a bit of fragmentation of liquidity, which is not optimal when you're trying to uh, buy a lot of stablecoins for uh, the cheapest price possible, but it diversifies risk and people won't see the difference. Yep. Yeah, and I want to give an example on this because it's already real. So. Maker is the largest holder of USDCs in the world. So we, I think we, we own roughly 10% of the current float of USDCs in our treasury. So it's our main treasury asset. We are leveraging on their ability to on-ramp liquidity from the real world, on their ability to face the regulator, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And we use it as a, as, a, as a pillar to build another credit overlay on top. Now, they, DAI, the DAI, the Maker minted DAI, is a great... Uh, a way to add this monetary expansion layer because it's very it's very stable you can trust it but then it's not very capital efficient or it's probably not the best instrument for payments so we might have we might see a, a point we might get to a point where an angle or um or another product pro uh, protocol or a, for example a stable coin running on polygon which is a way more efficient uh, blockchain might use dai Sure. As, as their pillar and create a payment overlay sure. on sure. top. Sure. So that's, that's how you start seeing, you start seeing this line, uh, this value chain mm. uh, uh, creating. And for example, we, 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 we speak with our, with our colleagues at Circle all the time. 
we we are the largest holder, yeah. so they we are friends yeah, by yeah, definition. Yeah, yeah. So and we hope to be friends of other protocols that want to build build on top of what we are creating to do other stuff on uh, to create to add other functionalities to the monetary to the monetary chain. So so let me pick up a couple of those things. One problem that I see with the space at the moment, as as was mentioned already, in many ways it's very complicated. If you're a user trying to understand all of the different layers, all the different choices, this sort of thing. And on the one hand, the story that you're telling is that the choice just gets broader and broader. On the other hand, the problem that we see with something like Terra is when things go wrong, people who are close to the protocol, whether that's investors, insiders, these sorts of things, have a very privileged position in terms of seeing something going wrong, taking the money out, whereas your average punter who's not watching the liquidity balance on different exchanges and that sort of thing is in a very disadvantaged position. So how do we get from where we are today to both the simplification of the environment and so that you know this decentralized dream where everybody has equal access to things is not you know a tremendous disadvantage for Joe Public versus the insiders, which is you know going back to a whole lot of things that we we're trying to get away from in the first place. I don't know who wants to pick that up, Nicola. Do uh, you have any thoughts? Yeah, I, I would say that again, it comes down to kind of regulation and from consumer perspective, understanding or business perspective, understanding uh, what you're interacting with, what are the uh, how, how are these products constructed? How can you use them? What are the underlying risks? Um, if you're looking to scale, mm -hmm. right? And secondly, there's also the theme of, I would say, interoperability because moving in from, you know, one underlying infrastructure layer to another today is fairly complicated mm -hmm. um, for an average user, even average business. And, and again, moving into the world and a future where you would have a, a large level of application and uh, interaction between hundreds of thousands of businesses, millions of businesses and, and users, you would need to kind of take away this and, and really simplify it. You know, there was like 30 odd billion invested by VC funds in various uh, crypto projects in 2021. We do expect a lot of that will go into removing the friction for users and trying to make some mass market applications. We're excited to see kind of what's, what's coming around. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'd say that there is a lot of noise currently in the crypto markets. Yep. Uh, it's hard to distinguish uh, scammers from serious yes. people. Um, so we need more education and educational tools uh, for new DeFi users. But the best advice for people wanting to invest in DeFi is do your own research. I understand and I know that <laughs> it doesn't scale to get a billion users to decentralized finance. Yep. But I don't think like as a developer in a stablecoin protocol that it's our job. Uh, we, we are taking our part in it, you know, we are making a lot of educational content. But what, what we are good at is making something that is truly stable and that you can trust. Mm. For like saying we are the serious ones, don't use these ones. I feel that other people are better suited than, than we are. And our role is just to build something that you can always trust. And then people will build around it uh, and, and see the value in it. So we, we need um, credible influencers um, and people who, who share respectable opinions and who don't promote scams uh, all along. So the way. I want to put Luca on the spot here in the sense that you are writing blogs or you know Substack pieces. Yes as a researcher, but you're also somebody who has a great deal of visibility of what's going on below the hood. What would be some of your recommendations in terms of how people should think about one stablecoin project versus the other in terms of things like smart contract risk, credit risk, liquidity risk, all of these sorts of things? What are the takeaways that we can take away that we know a little bit more than when we came to this seminar? So I think I, um, I live my life uh, loyal to a golden rule, never to trust black boxes. <laughs> never, ever. Uh, it's, uh, it's just a very lazy thing to do, and then it comes back to bite you. So um, in the case of Maker, for example, when we say we are a decentralized stablecoin, it doesn't mean that everybody, everyone has the same level of control over the protocol, because ultimately there are probably 10 larger, large holders and they control the sure. protocol. Sure. So the difference is that you have total visibility of what's going on. So if you, you want to do your own research, you can, uh, you can do it. Now, 
maybe you don't have time to do your own research, so you need to decide whom, whom you, you want to sure, trust. Sure. So in the case of USDC, uh, you are deciding that you can trust the, the regulator, the US regulators, because it's probably a good thing to do, given that they are controlling also the, the, the banking system. Uh, in the case of Maker, if, if you are a crypto native, you, you can decide to do your own research and just trust yourself or you trust the on-chain data. In the case of USDT, I don't, really, I don't really know how to answer. <laughs> but in the case of Terra, it was quite, it was quite obvious. Like, yep. uh, do you really want to trust a team of savants or, or yep. gurus, whatever? I don't like gurus. I think <laughs> gurus are usually um, dangerous things. Yeah. Dangerous, dangerous things. So. Uh, but everything is there, so I think the, the beauty, the beauty of uh, on-chain smart contract-based protocols is not that everyone can have a, an equal an, an equal uh, controlling influence, but that everything is out there for you to check. Sure. So there is no, there are no, there shouldn't be secrets. Yeah. Great. Good. Well, we've we've got just under 15 minutes left, and I definitely want to leave time for audience Q and A. So. If anybody has a question, please raise your hand. Maybe we can get a, get a microphone there. Well, can we start at the back? Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Joshua. I'm from Small Finance. Um, we actually have integrated both Dai uh, and the Euro stablecoin from Angle Protocol. Uh, I just wanted to ask you guys, what is your sort of view on how the regular retail, not crypto native retail, I'm talking people who are entering into the market now for the first time, seeing stablecoins for the first time after Terra, what is the one use case you think? that will bring them to use decentralized stablecoins? Um, so the, the first use cases are not the, the ones for which, I mean, personally, the, the use cases of stablecoins uh, are not the one for which I am building stablecoins. Right now, the use cases of stablecoins are mostly getting leverage farming. But the reason why we are building stablecoin is to create a whole new composable layer of payment, insensorable, permissionless, that allows to exchange money all around the world without paying too much fees to to people, to, to institutions, uh, and leaving enough money on the hands of people who are spending this money. So I think uh, to get more people to stablecoins, we need another bull market where, uh, no, but it's true. Uh, yeah, it's, no, sure. We need another bull market of people willing to take leverage to open credit lines with Maker, soon with Engel. Um, and uh, on, the, on the other side, we also need people building UX, UX products. Uh, Venmo decentralized Venmo applications uh, where they will be able to spend their money uh, without being censored and while being able to send it to different wallets. Yeah, and if I can add, I think if, I, if, if we think about the use cases in three buckets, uh, reserving payments and credit, I think in reserving Maker is really a good product. You can trust DAI. It's been proven by at least by the, the recent downturns that you can trust DAI to preserve your, your value within crypto if you don't want to leave crypto. In payments, we need somebody else to do the heavy lifting and create systems uh, that actually like also the traditional payment rails like Visa that can facilitate the use of, of crypto, crypto stables for payments in an efficient way because this is not the case now. And on credit, I, I hope that business, not retail, but businesses can act internationally, can access the stablecoin liquidity to fund their projects. But it's not Maker that has to do it. I think other, other projects need, need, need to build a bridge. And it's already happening. And we are integrating, we are e exploring the potential integration with projects like Maple Finance, like that works on uh, crypto specific borrowers, but real world businesses, Goldfinch, that. Uh, focuses on emerging markets, uh, emerging markets for um, for consumer and business and, and business uses, Credix, TrueFi, so other product projects that are creating this bridge to onboard uh, business and retail use cases. We are just creating the engine, but we need others to create the to create the car around it. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, I have a, a question. I wrote it here. So, uh, what should I say? So, Satoshi made Bitcoin to look like synthetic, hard, scarce money, or made Bitcoin to look like, uh, you know, synthetic gold. So, one can argue that Satoshi was an advocate of the Austrian school of economics, uh, you know, Austrian money th theory. And I feel like more, more and more uh, companies are doing credit and like printing money. And do you think the crypto world should move towards uh, an MMT uh, kind of, you know, uh, modern money theory, 
or should move towards a future that looks more like an Austrian money theory? That's that's a good question. Let me let me point Nicola to, to that one as a start. <laughs> yeah, hard money consistency with stablecoin, you know, financial engineering. How do we square that circle? It's a very hard uh, thing to do, but uh, I would say that, again, it comes down to uh, a very basic level of you need to understand what you're entering in as, as a consumer, whether it's, you know, you're using a uh, you know, fiat-backed stable coin to make a payment or, or emittance or like money transfer between businesses or you're, as a user, accessing your app and you have like a payments piece and you have investment piece, which is like, say, a DeFi protocol, you can put your assets that you're buying in the same kind of um, uh, proposition, it, you, you, I agree, you need to do your own research. But at the same time, I would argue that uh, at some level, you need to have a, a regulation coming in, which can also help, you know, make sure that that, that car builder on the engine that Luca and the guys are building is running smoother and faster. And it's not going at 150 miles per hour in like, you know, in the center of the city, but at the right speed and in the right kind of instances. So let, let me just pick up very briefly on that. One of Satoshi's original or when, when the Bitcoin white paper came out and so on, it was very much about peer to peer lending. It was about cutting out counterparties which took you know economic rents out of the picture and, and this sort of thing in a sense using some of these stable coin protocols to make the payments rails smoother and cheaper and that sort of thing must be something that visa is very interested in in the sense that you know if credit card fees are two two and a quarter three percent very little of that actually goes to visa i think a lot of people think that visa takes you know that massive share of it but a lot of it gets passed on to banks and other people in the network and so on so from your perspective using stable coins or integrating stable coins into your offering what do you see that doing so we're definitely like looking at exploring the ways we can innovate in this space as you know we have already done a test transaction for you this settlement where you know whereas you can settle with us now as an issuer on a daily basis uh, in USDC. Uh, we hope to uh, see the development of a settlement with acquirers as well in the future. And, and again, f for us, it, it really um, depends on whether the businesses that we are working with want to use stable coins, central bank digital currencies, fiat money. We want to make sure that we give them a different uh, set of networks that they can work with to settle with us and work with us. And kind of we see ourselves as it's kind of bridge between clients and different networks yeah. playing the role of the network or network. So yeah. again, we are not in the business of picking winners. We are in the yep. business of making sure that consumers and businesses can exchange uh, value and, and kind of transfer money between each other. Mm. Yeah. L Luca, do you want to have a one go at that as well? Because on the one hand, you've got, you know, these decentralized stable coins, which are in many ways, cutting out the banks and so on. On the other hand, you've got this very interesting kind of financial engineering thing going on behind. Yeah, yeah I, I think I'll try to give a short answer, my, my personal point of view. I think uh, deflationary, deflationary currency is awful currency. It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't fulfill its, uh, its a function of allocating uh, resources, because if, if you have a deflationary currency, you want to keep it, you don't want to spend it or you no, know, you don't want to consume it, you don't want to invest it. So it's, it's a good reserve, it's a good reserve asset, but it's not a good currency in the modern, in the, in the, in the modern way of thinking. And you know, since Bretton Woods, we kind of learned that probably pegging to the, to the, to the gold is not a good idea. I think m modern monetary theory sometimes is, is a meme that says, okay, we can print as much as we want without inflation coming back to bite us. And I think <laughs> like two days, ago, the, the, two, two days ago, the print was like probably eight and a half, nine percent inflation annualized in the US. So I think it's not really, uh, it's not really uh, magic that is going to happen. So I, I think in, uh, our ambition in crypto is to create a more efficient layer to, to create monetary, uh, create credit and allocate it internationally in a more, uh, in a more sustainable way. Now we don't need to, we need to do this cautiously because otherwise it's going to go out of hand. We're going to print, we're going to create too much of that. Yeah. And this is going to, is going to inflate the whole monetary base and ultimately will, 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 will not allocate money efficiently. But I think our ambition is to create a more so it's not going back to the, to the gold standard, but to create a more efficient and distributed way to allocate credit. Thank you. That's a very good question. Maybe we've got five minutes left. Could we pull the next two questions and, and sort of how we go, go see how we go with those? 
Just a quick follow-up for Nicola. Um, given what you guys had learned on Libra and etc., why not just do a Visa stablecoin? And I'm sure you guys must have looked at it. No, we, we, we as mentioned, we are uh, a payments network, a payments technology company, and we're not in the. We are we are looking to work with um, both fiat pack digital currency, the form of stable coins, central bank digital currencies, as uh, a potentially additional um, currency to settle on our network. Sure. Hey there, guys. Um, Luca, in a panel you did with Superfluid, you mentioned that Maker has a quasi zero cost of capital, which gets us into really interesting territory. And I want to ask you about the differences in cost of capital between Maker and between traditional banks and central banks. Obviously, central banks probably having the lowest cost of capital, but Maker can fundamentally or, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but basically mint US dollars at a pretty much zero cost of capital. Um, is, if, that, if it's true that Maker can do that structurally, cheaper than banks, then DeFi is in a really, really good place long term. What are the foundations of that argument? So I think uh, there are two elements of this, uh, of this argument. The first one is structural. The other one is, is, an arb, is an arbitrage. The first one, which is the most important one, I think uh, Maker is a very efficient and transparent system to onboard collateral and print money. So if you go, if you go into a bank and if you are intellectually honest, you'll probably know that 70% of the cost of a bank are not adding value. I worked in a bank myself, <laughs> so I, I'll take responsibility for what I say. Um, in Maker, this is not the case, but obviously to maintain that efficiency, it means that we need to abstract a lot of heavy lifting to other protocols. Otherwise, it just means that we are running a lot of risk and we are not controlling for that risk. So I think it, one part of that is structural. Now we can apply that zero cost of capital uh, on collaterals that are very liquid and very large, like Bitcoin and ETH. If we want to do it to something that is a bit more structured, then we need protocols that are actually aligning all the underwriting for us. The second one is, is an arbitrage. Because of the fact that we are not regulated, we have very little capital buffers, we have very little liquidity concerns, so we don't have to pay for that, those buffers internally. That's why we don't pay for it implicitly with our cost of capital. That will change. And I am the first one that is advocating an increase in the surplus buffer. So it means that that, that cost of capital, I hope, is not going to be zero anymore, but it will not be 12, 15% like a bank. It will probably be 2, 3, 2 3%. In, in, a, in, a most, in a recent IMF published uh, report, they, were, they themselves were admitting that, that DeFi has a very, very low cost of capital, lower than traditional banks. So I agree with you that that's what we'd want to build. We want to build rails that are very solid so that in the next bull market, we can onboard, we can steal market share from traditional banks that are not onboarding collateral efficiently. And I, I am an, I'm extremely optimistic about that, but there is a lot of work to do. Good. So maybe just any last questions or any, actually, let's just go through the panel. Just closing thoughts. Um, you know, it can be on the state of the crypto market, anything else. What's, what would you like to leave people with today in terms of, you know, a statement? Uh, I'd conclude that uh, so far everything has been centered on the US dollar. What we're trying to build at Engel is tools for people and anywhere in the world to enjoy DeFi and soon to enjoy low cost of capital uh, on their home currency without having to care about change risk. And this is something which still needs to be built. We have the knowledge to build that, like Maker could build it. Uh, we uh, have our mission to build it. We, we had a big learning curve on the euro, but there is uh, still a lot to do uh, and potentially better models to be found again for decentralized stable coins. Sure. Like, sure. It's still the early days. My last, my last comment, comment is a call to action. I think here we are not, uh, we are not in the guessing game. We are, we are in the building game. So the, the, the only ones who can screw this future is us. And, and I, I really think that we, need, we do our best to, to create like solid projects that can grow in a very uh, respectful and equalitarian way. Because in this way, we will create this future. Otherwise, we will just delay it by 10, 20 years. Good. Great. We are looking forward for uh, future developments, innovation, and uh, stable coins in other currencies other than US dollar and also CBDCs in other currencies. 
And of course, uh, looking forward to see where kind of the uh, consumer UX will improve, and what kind of propositions will be built to make it easier to effectively use stable coins for everyday payments use cases. Great. Well, thank you very much. We're right out of time, almost to the second. Thank you for, uh, for joining us.